please welcome to the stage, Idong Jong. Uh, good morning, and I hope uh, everybody is having a good time so far. Um, so it's a, a little bit early, so uh, we understand, so we, you know, postpone the meeting start 15 minutes later so to have for people to come, come in. So hope uh, we have enough people now. Um, so uh, first of all, I'd like to start with the program today. And uh, uh, so we will start with the uh, keynote speech. And then after that, uh, we will start. I go. So I hope you can see so a little bit. Hmm? No, no. Why is it going? So um, for today, we have a full schedule. This is the first day for the conference, uh, a main conference. And uh, starting uh, right after the keynote speech, there is a, a coffee break. The co coffee break is way the, in the back of the exhibit hall. Okay, so where the poster was uh, yes, last night. So hope uh, you know where it is. Uh, and, and then the uh, 10 o'clock, we start uh, uh, all the program. Uh, so let me see. You cannot go back. Oh. Um, OK, so I don't think we have a, where is the schedule? Yeah, here. Huh? OK, so uh, the, if you look at the, your booklet, the schedule start uh, uh, 10, where is it? So coffee break, and then uh, 10 o'clock start the main conference, uh, all the event. But uh, we do have a couple of tutorials, uh, which uh, was postponed to today. Uh, so we have uh, some hands-on uh, tutorial and in the morning and afternoon. And also we have, uh, what are other things? So we also have the ADS invited talks today. And then the government day uh, is a special day, the only special day left, I believe, uh, for today. Uh, that is 10 o'clock until 5. Uh, so other things, so starting with uh, 10 o'clock with the main research presentations, I believe we have uh, five, six uh, uh, parallel sessions uh, going on starting 10 o'clock and uh, all the way until uh, 5 p.m. in the afternoon. Okay, so hope uh, uh, you can see those uh, uh, schedule. Um, and then, I don't know what happened. So uh, I hope to mention, uh, you know, hope people, oh, why this is not uh, stable? Going back? Not going back? OK. So I hope to emphasize uh, tomorrow evening, 6 o'clock, we have the KDD celebration dinner and hosted by Meta. So hope everybody will come to the dinner. Uh, and then we will have the best paper awards uh, you know, to be presented. So, uh, so hope everybody will be here. And uh, so I hope to mention this is a, a, a special event because we are in DC, so we arranged this. This has not been uh, arranged in the past. So, so the first time, and probably the only time, because we are in the, in the capital of the nation, so we arranged the uh, government day with uh, uh, program directors from uh, various uh, different uh, uh, agencies, including NSF, and especially for the AAA uh, 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 cluster division. So hope you will have a chance to meet them. And after lunch, I want to mention 
uh, NSF created a new directorate called uh, uh, Technology Innovation and Partnership. So the director uh, of that division is uh, coming to give to Erwin. She will, he will come to give the uh, introduction for that new directorate. Uh, and then following that, uh, we will have uh, NIH program directors start with uh, Associate uh, uh, Director for Data Science, Susan, and, and other program directors. And then the last session will be the program directors from USDA, DAPA, and ARPA. So they have uh, uh, all different kind of uh, AI data science related programs, so hope uh, uh, you guys will, will, will attend. Uh, this uh, uh, special day will be at uh, uh, Salon A and B, okay? Uh, any other things? I think that's the end of the, uh, the, the, pre the introduction for the today. So now we get to our new, uh, you know, the starting of the main program. It is my honor to introduce our first keynote speaker, Dr. Lisa Gatou, here today. And uh, Dr. Lisa Gatou, okay, I don't think I can see this well, is a professor at the Computer Science and Engineering uh, Department at UC Santa Cruz. Um, so where is he, she holds the endowed chair position uh, for computer engineering. And uh, uh, she, she is also the founding director of the Data Science Institute and Center at Center, uh, UC Santa Cruz. And Dr. Gatou is a fellow of ACM, AAAI, and IEEE. And her research interests include machine learning, and uh, probabilistic uh, uh, learning and uncertainty. And she, I cannot see what, so. And she has extensive experience in all this research. And, and Dr. Gatou got a PhD from Stanford University, and she was a professor at University of Maryland College Park from 2001 to 2013. And thank you for coming today to give this uh, talk, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Yes. Thanks. Yes. All right. Let's see. Uh, I'm not seeing my slides up. Title slide. All right. All right. Well. Um, if at any point there's any issues with sound, let me know. But um, I want to start by thanking the organizers. What a huge honor to be an opening keynote at the first KDD that's been in person for quite a while. And it's really nice to give a talk to like live people. This is the first time that I've done this in a while. And it's, yeah. And it, I mean, it's so good to be here all together, and what a testament to the power of relational thinking, <laughs> just being here. Um, so what is relational thinking? Uh, it's interesting because across a variety of different areas, um, it's used, and it has different meanings in each of these different areas. So. Within psychology, it's basically this idea that we can um, manipulate representations of objects and attributes and their relationships. Within sociology, not surprisingly, it's about ties and ties between individuals and ties between individuals and organizations. Uh, it's interesting within mathematics, the meaning is often the ability to go from the kind of um, instance level to the more abstract. So the most common um, example given is going from just being able to do simple 
arithmetic calculations to the more general ideas of algebra and more. Um, and then finally, in philosophy, um, actually there's a bunch of different meanings within philosophy, but one is relationalism, this idea that even reality um, is only about the relationships between things. And then, you know, they go deeper than this and talk about non-duality, mind-body, um, objectivity and subjectivity. And, you know, at that point, it makes my head hurt. And really what I'm interested in is what is relational thinking from a KDD perspective? You know, I'm more of an engineer than a philosopher. So within KDD, one of the things about relational thinking is the ability to make use of structure. And so there's structure in the inputs. So within KDD, you know, there were a bunch of workshops about graphs. There's a bunch of sessions about graphs, tutorials about graphs. So we're familiar with this idea that within the input, there's often rich structure. And there's also structure in the output. So many cases, your decision variables actually have dependencies among them. And so you want to reason about them not independently or atomistically, but about the uh, collective or joint um, optimization. And then there's also uncertainty. And there's uncertainty in the inputs, you know, noise and so on. And there's uncertainty in the outputs, so we would like to be able to, in some way, um, capture this uncertainty. So what I'm going to argue is we really need scalable methods that take into account structure and uncertainty. And in this talk, what I hope I'll be able to do is provide you with both tools and patterns for relational thinking. And these tools and patterns are going to make use of both logic and probability, so hard and soft, and they're also going to make use of neuro and symbolic reasoning. So the way that this talk is structured is that I have a first portion that's kind of very tutorial and accessible. I think these are really useful relational thinking patterns for anybody in KDD to be aware of. Then I'm going to do a section that's a little bit more deeper technical dive into some of the methods. Uh, then I'm going to talk about something that, of course, is near and dear to KDD's heart. How do you really get these things to scale? Um, and then I'll talk about um, some applications and some opportunities and challenges. So for patterns, I'm going to capture these patterns as logical rules. So logic is nice. It is an easy way of capturing structure, tends to be interpretable. But don't worry, I'm going to do that for you know, the first part of the talk, but then I'm going to be actually relaxing that. So the structure prediction patterns that I'm going to cover um, are ones that, if people have seen me talk before, they know these are kind of my bread and butter. Uh, but uh, I think I'll present them in a little different way than maybe you've seen them before. Um, so collective classification is the first one. And this is really the most basic one. And this is the idea of um, you have nodes in a graph. You're trying to label them. Um, what is the little structural pattern? And how can we represent it in logic? So the pattern that I like to use is the following one, um, where we have a local predictor. That local predictor is something that gives us some information about the label. And then we have the second rule, which propagates the labels through the links. Now, the thing to note about this is this predicate the label predicate is the thing that I'm trying to infer. And by the fact that it's on both sides of the rule, that's the thing that makes the decisions dependent. And so um, I like to illustrate this with uh, a little cartoon. 
uh, particularly appropriate being in DC, where you have a social network and you're trying to figure out uh, what the political persuasion of the people in it are. Typically, the way these are set up are that you have some observed labels, and then you have some nodes where you're trying to figure out what their labels are, and um, how do we instantiate that little pattern that I gave you guys? Well, we can have a bunch of local rules that just use information about the individuals. So, you know, if they donate to a particular party, they're more likely to vote for a party. Um, if they mention some keywords in their social media, they're more likely to vote for a party. Um, but then we have the relational rules, and the relational rules can be things like, oh, you know, if their friends vote for a party, they're more likely to vote for a party. Um, if their spouse votes for a party, they're more likely to vote for a party. And in general, with this, then we can go from our partially labeled um, network and infer in a joint way where the labels all depend on each other, the labels for the unobserved nodes. Now, as an aside, this is actually exactly the issue with why privacy in graphs is hard, because of this information that can be leaked. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more um, later in the talk. So that's the first pattern. The next pattern is about edges, so link prediction. And again, we have this really simple kind of logical rule that says if x and y are linked, z is similar to y, then x and z are linked. And again, you see the predicate link. That's the thing that we're trying to infer, and it's on both sides of the rule. So what's an uh, instance of this, you know, the one that, again, a lot of folks in this community work on is recommender systems. You can instantiate that little rule in a way um, as follows. We can have the following where we have a person and items, and we can have that if a user likes item one, and item two is similar to item one, then the user may like item two. Um, so the solid lines are what's observed, and the dashed line is what I'm predicting. Now we can go the other way, where we say, you know, if we have two users that are similar, then the second user is likely to like the item. And the challenge in this is how do we do, deal with that similarity predicate, and in particular, how do we deal with that and get it to scale? The next pattern that I want to cover is entity resolution, which is figuring out when nodes in the graph are referring to the same underlying entity. And again, we can use kind of local information and just say, oh, you know, if they have similar names, they're likely to be the same. If they link to similar things, they're likely to be the same. But the relational pattern is particularly interesting where we have this kind of, if X and Y are the same, Y and Z are the same, then X and Z are the same. So this is a transitivity rule. And again, we see that the predicate we're trying to infer is on both sides of the rule. Um, this is common, but then there's other kinds of problems where in entity resolution, you're really doing a matching kind of problem, where you're saying that if X and Y are the same, then X cannot be the same as Z. And this is a kind of mutual exclusion. And you'll find in entity resolution problems, they tend to either be of this form where they're kind of doing clustering or they're doing matching. And it's really important to know which one you're doing um, when you're solving the problem. So um, these are all the little micro patterns. My actual favorite pattern is to do all of them at the same time. And this is actually um, 
from a KDD paper a little bit more than 10 years ago uh, called graph identification. And in this, the key idea is we start off, we have some input graph, but it's noisy. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to infer an output graph that's clean and that we want to do our analysis on. So what's involved? Well, you have these different networks. One is, I'm going to illustrate this and define it by cartoon again. Um, so we have this communication network where the nodes are email addresses, the links are communications, and attributes are the words in the communications. Uh, we have our output graph, which is people, and then their organizational relationships and their organizational titles. So we can set this up and use our little patterns where um, we, all we have observed initially is the communication graph. So the first thing we have to do is we have to figure out the nodes. And then the next thing we have to do is we have to figure out the edges in the graph. Go through and do that. And then finally, we need to figure out the um, titles or label the nodes and go through and do uh, that. So what's interesting about this is it really highlights the dependencies. And a lot of the work has looked at these individual problems, collective classification, link prediction, and entity resolution independently. But in graph identification, we emphasize that they're, you know, not surprisingly evidence dependent. Um, they're also intra dependent, and that's what I tried to emphasize with the rules where the predicates were on both sides. But they're also interdependent. So when I'm doing inference, for example, for predicting links, well, obviously that depends on what I did for entity resolution and what I did for collective classification and uh, vice versa. So it's actually exactly these kinds of problems that have really motivated my research over the years, kind of doing these relatively um, complex graph kinds of inference problems. So I'm now going to talk about tools for actually doing these things. And the tools that I'm going to describe are tools that both combine statistical relational and neurosymbolic. I'm going to start with the statistical relational. Um, for statistical relational, the idea is to make use of logic, uncertainty, and do these kind of collective inference kinds of problems. Um, there's been a ton of work in this space. There's a lot of different languages out there. And we're adding one to the mix. Probabilistic soft logic. So um, probabilistic soft logic very much builds on the work that's been done so far. And then I'm going to highlight the things that I think are uniquely interesting about PSL. But at a high level, what you can think of is that logical rules, you know, they have some advantages, but they have a lot of disadvantages. They're intractable in general, you can't handle uncertainties, and you can't represent degree of similarity. So what we're going to try and do is turn these disadvantages into advantages, do something that's tractable, handles uncertainty or inconsistencies, and degree of similarity. So PSL is a probabilistic programming language. At its heart, there's a collection of weighted logical rules. One of the things that's a little bit different is that the ground atoms here are not going to be logical 0, 1. They're going to be continuous valued between 0 and 1. And a PSL program is basically a collection of weighted rules, some data, you instantiate that, and then you get out a probability distribution. What is unique is PSL makes reasoning tractable by taking 
logical inference and mapping it to convex optimization. And I'm going to describe a little bit about the foundations of how we do this. This is very nice work by my former PhD student, Stephen Bach, and former postdoc, Bert Wong. Um, so the key idea is we're going to map inference to a particular uh, convex problem. Now, um, I know I haven't described this yet, but kind of burn this equation into your mind. It's a particular relaxation. And the thing that's interesting about the relaxation of the problem is it comes up through a interpretation from theoretical computer science, one from machine learning, and one from AI. Um, these are coming from randomized algorithms, graphical models, and soft logic. And so I'm going to kind of go through at a high level these different approaches and then how we get to that same um, formalism. So let's start with the TCS view. Uh, we have these weighted logical rules uh, that have weights. I'm going to represent them in clausal form. I'm going to pull out the positive literals and the negated literals. Then I can formulate weighted maxat as trying to find the assignments of the random variables that will maximize the weighted sum of all of the rules. And now we all know from our undergrad algorithms class that this is a canonical NP-hard problem. So now we're going to make use of a result from randomized algorithms where we're going to view these random variables rather than logical variables. We're going to use them as, uh, interpret them as probabilities. So the probability that I round up to one or down to zero. And we can make use of this very nice result from Goymans and Williams, which puts a bound on the expected score. And actually, it can be extended to give a three quarters optimal rounding guarantee. And if we look closely at the form of this bound as a linear program, it, because I know you all remember the equation that I put on the slides a few minutes ago, has exactly the form uh, that I had there. So this is one way to get to the relaxation. A second way to get to the relaxation is using graphical models. So with graphical models, we can define a factor graph over the logical variables. So we have our logical variables, random variables. We have our rules. We're going to interpret the rules as potential functions in the factor graph. They're kind of weird potential functions because they're kind of logical rules. Um, and then we can do what people in graphical models do. We can define a distribution over this. Um, and then we can do map inference, find the most probable assignment by maximizing the exponent. You know, at this point, we haven't done anything. We've basically just translated maxat language into uh, different formalism. But now we can start doing something interesting. Um, to solve this problem, one of the ways you can do it is you can find a globally consistent set of marginal distributions. Um, you can formulate this as a big linear program. The only issue is it's so big, um, it's not going to be tractable. You have exponentially many constraints. So what people do in graphical models is they do a local consistency relaxation where they only enforce some of the constraints. Um, so we're going to do that here. And what we're going to do is we're going to introduce pseudo marginals and only enforce the constraints um, over some of the uh, potential states, combination of potential states. Then we can rewrite that exponent expression as constraints over the mu's and the uh, potentials. And with a little bit of work, a little bit of analysis, we can then rewrite that again 
and push in the expression so that the expression is only over the mu's. Um, and this ends up giving the following equation. You know, hopefully this equation is maybe starting to look familiar, uh, but in case it's not, let me put the two side by side. We've done one interpretation from randomized algorithms that has a bound, another one from graphical models. They look the same. And one of the nice results, you know, irrespective of PSL, is just the local consistency relaxation community hadn't had bounds. So we can use the bounds that we got from the randomized max set. And that's an interesting result in and of itself. Um, but there's a third interpretation. And the third interpretation makes use of soft logic. And here, the random variables are really going to be um, either similarities or uh, degree of truth. We're going to use a particular soft logic, Lukashevitz logic, and using this now, not the approximate anymore, the exact max sat solution is represented as follows. And at this point, you can actually interpret this a little bit more, at least I would say. Um, when you look at this inner expression, it's really about the degree of satisfaction of the rule. So either it's satisfied, it's one, you have this big disjunction, or you kind of sum up the um, degree of truth of the components. And again, this has the same um, uh, form as before. So what we've done is we've been able to say one formalism for reasoning scalably and accurately about logic, probability, and similarity. Now we went further than this, and we introduced a notion of hinge loss marker random fields. These um, generalize things a bit by making the potentials now hinges, and uh, they can be arbitrary linear functions, but with this, a PSL program, you know, this is a PSL program for that collective classification example that we had earlier. Um, and we take a program like that, some data, and then we get out this probability distribution. Now, I have not talked about how you learn these. And in the original version of the talk, I did, and it then took two hours. So I'm not going to talk very much about learning. Suffice it to say, we have a lot of work on how you learn the weights of these, and then near and dear to my heart, how you learn the structure of these. Uh, we have some work from last month at UAI learning explainable PSL models. Um, so talk to me afterwards about this. Um, but let's talk a little bit about, well, how well does this work in practice? And I'm going to um, go over some examples. This is actually kind of typical. This is where, this is a problem where we're doing activity recognition in video. There's um, some kind of standard features that are used in this community. We can add in just a little bit of PSL, so not particularly complex um, uh, model on top of it and get an increase in performance. So we've had this happen over and over again in different settings. Um, comparing to discrete approaches, again, this is kind of a simple setting, but we see that we do a little bit better in terms of predictive accuracy. But the key thing is that we're doing it significantly faster. And I'm going to do a deeper dive about that in a few minutes. Um, what about compared to similarity propagation methods? Well, here we're doing a drug target prediction task. And we're able to outperform um, something that is state of the art in that community. And then finally. Uh, example where we're doing emotion uh, detection and dialogue. And here we're comparing to a series of relatively sophisticated neural net models, and we're able to, again, 
significantly outperform them. So that leads me into, well, that was combining probability and logic. What about neurosymbolic? And the neurosymbolic community, the Nessi community, is, again, a big community that looks at combining sub-symbolic neural representations with symbolic reasoning. And again, there's been a ton of different languages proposed. Um, we're going to add one into the bunch, new PSL. Uh, new PSL um, uh, is actually, it's also a joint collaboration with William Wang and his group at UC Santa Barbara. Um, and I want to highlight um, some of the foundations of what we did that um, are a contribution in general to the Nessie community. And the first thing that we did is we um, introduced a notion of a neurosymbolic energy-based model. And the goal with this is to really highlight where the boundary is between the neural model and the symbolic model. And um, I'm going to try and illustrate this more with cartoon um, uh, than formally. But um, we have this overall system where we're going to factor the representation for the energy function. And we're going to look at the output variables y. Uh, we have some input variables x, which are the um, input variables to the symbolic portion of the system. Uh, we have some input variables to the neural net portion. We have the parameters for the symbolic system we have the parameters for the neural system. And then the key thing is this boundary from you know, where the neural system connects to the symbolic system. And um, you know, this is pretty simple and pretty general. And it is able to kind of represent many of the existing Nessie approaches. Um, so things like deep prob log, logic tensor networks, deep stock log, neural answer set programming, and probably a lot of others. Um, this is what then motivated us to develop deep hinge loss Markov random fields. And for deep hinge loss Markov random fields, you know, the key is to, again, look at this boundary. And we're going to represent the boundary, this psi function, as, not surprisingly, a hinge, but a hinge that has the particular form. And um, again, let me illustrate, then, what the pipeline looks like and highlight the interesting part of it. So, in these um, systems, what you can do, obviously, is you do inference. You do inference in the neural model. Then you do inference um, in the symbolic um, system, and so on. Uh, but for learning, again, we're going to do inference. Now we can calculate the loss and feed that back in. And the key result with the deep um, hinge loss Markov random fields is actually showing how you can kind of propagate the gradient through appropriately. Um, so new PSL, the benefits are it's expressive. It has everything um, in PSL syntax. Um, it's scalable, and it's easy to use. So you can use it with any number of neural net packages, architectures, and we have end-to-end -end gradient learning for all of the parameters. So in terms of experiments, um, I'm just going to give one that's simple to describe. Uh, um, I tried to uh, do a more complex one, but it, it took more time, even though it's a little more interesting. Um, 
so this is on a standard collective classification data sets uh, that have a lot of issues, aren't the greatest data sets, uh, which I can say since I'm the one that published um, them. Um, so uh, comparing to uh, label propagation, where you're just using the labels, uh, to two existing uh, NESI systems, neuro PSL or new PSL is able to significantly outperform them. And for GCNs, we're doing a bit better than GCNs, but our overall model is significantly simpler in terms of parameters and so on. So this, there's a lot more to say here, but I want to get to something that, uh, again, I think is going to be of particular interest to this community, which is around scaling. And um, for scaling these systems, there's, if you look at the overall um, process, we have these logical rules, weighted logical rules, we have data, we kind of ground that out to create a big graphical model, and then we do inference. There's two places where we can speed up this process. So one is around inference. I'm going to talk about that first. And the second one is around grounding. So for inference, you know, already with the foundations, we were able to take something that was fundamentally intractable and map it to a convex optimization problem, but still it's going to be a really big convex optimization problem. And it turns out there's a fair bit of structure in it. So we can make use of this structure and use optimization algorithms which can make you exploit that. Um, the initial work that we did was using ADMM, alternating direction method of multipliers. And this is something that's used commonly within the machine learning community. And the idea is simple. You just break things into subproblems, you solve them, recombine them. The interesting thing is that for um, convex problems, you can show that it's guaranteed to converge. Um, with hinge loss mark of random fields, the thing that we needed to ensure is that you could solve the subproblems quickly. And so it turns out you have these little hinges where there's a part where, you know, the rule is just satisfied and then it's dissatisfied. And so being smart about how you figure out which portions are important was key to getting this to work. Um, but here's some results. This is from version, PSL version 2.0, so 2018, where uh, we compare with an off-the-shelf optimizer, a commercial-grade optimizer, and with our ADMM um, implementation of inference. And we're able to take things that take three hours with the off-the-shelf optimizer and do them in a few seconds, and things that have um, eight million potentials we can do in less than a minute. So. Um, this is really great. We're very excited about these results. Um, but interestingly, even for this 8 million potential case, the inference is a minute, but the grounding was the bulk of the time. The grounding took like five minutes. So we have a whole line of work that is to speed up grounding. And the thing that I like about this work is we're really using a lot of smart ideas from the database community to do this. And so what is the problem with grounding? Um, simply, we're instantiating these rules. And even if you have something as simple as a pairwise similarity, you have n nodes, you're going to get n cross n, n squared blow up, and it can easily get like way worse than this. Um, so the first approach that we look at is blocking. And this is the idea. You have uh, pairwise all combinations. Break this into blocks and only consider um, uh, things within the blocks. And 
This has been studied both in the database community under certain names, within the KDD community, um, within the theoretical science community. So there's a variety of different ways of doing this. What we made use of in PSL is first off to ensure when we're going to do the grounding, we're gonna ensure that all of our queries are conjunctive queries. And then we're going to give the database optimizer hints as far as which of the predicates are blocking predicates. And in doing this, we can improve grounding. So notice that this is actually on a log scale. So we can get up to 100 times speed up in um, uh, problems. And there's a lot more details to this that I'm not able to go into. Um, but to give you a flavor for where the community has come, if we look at different SRL kind of milestones in terms of size of problems and amount of time spent grounding, you know, in 2007, with Alchemy, we're doing things of, with a million uh, potentials, and it takes 400 minutes. Tuffy was a significant improvement on that in terms of speed. Uh, Fox PSL is a distributed um, implementation of PSL. And this version that I just showed, PSL, this is 2.1, um, is able to do things uh, much larger and in a reasonable amount of time. We have some additional results where we sped things up. This was really about smart memory allocation and kind of systems kind of thing um, to get this down even further. Um, but we can go further than this. And uh, blocking is just one aspect. Now, another thing that we can do is we can do smarter um, grounding for everything. And this is the notion of collective grounding. And here, the idea is that we have to ground all of these different rules. There's different queries and different ways that you can um, ground them. Let's do some query optimization over them to select the subset that um, contains all the things that we need to compute and covers everything that we need. And so this is work that uses ideas from the database community in multi-query optimization to do this efficiently. And using this, um, this is across a bunch of different data sets that we have up on our uh, uh, site. Um, First off, the interesting thing is you would think like, oh, doing this fancy query optimization, you might pay a big price. You can't really see it on here for the smaller data sets, but it turns out it's not too much overhead. But then on more complex problems, we're able to speed things up even more. And potentially there's a lot of room for even more speed up. So this leads to another line in this table where we've taken this problem that's 150 million groundings and gotten, or uh, potentials, and gotten the grounding time down to two minutes. Um, but wait, there's more. Um, so then we did this work on what we call tandem inference. And again, let's go back to the overall process that we had before. Um, where we're instantiating the big graphical model. It's like, why block on instantiating the whole model before you even start working? What you can do is introduce a framework where you're doing streaming grounding and streaming inference. And in this work, we were able to show, you know, we're comparing to um, the black line is tandem inference and the blue and red are two different implementations of the PSL optimizer that across these different problems, we're able to 
in many cases, or in all of these cases, get you know good solutions before we've even you know started grounding the other models. Um, but in addition, once you have this streaming framework, what you can do is smarter memory management. So you can do something where you kind of are able to deal with models that are so large that they won't fit in main memory. You can page them in and out in intelligent ways. And with this, we're able to really kind of push the boundaries of the size of models that people are able to do with these um, SRL systems. So uh, we're able to go to over a billion ground rules and do that using um, now looking at memory, a reasonable uh, amount of memory. So this brings us to a new line in these SRL grounding milestones where we're now able to do things that are orders of magnitude larger and again, do them in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, we also have work on the online PSL, which I'm not going to go into, but the idea is we can add variables and delete variables, add and delete uh, rules. Um, I do want to talk a teeny bit about applications just because we've done a lot in this space and to give one a flavor of the different things that we've done. We've done a fair bit in computational biology and health informatics. Uh, we've done work in natural language processing. We've done work in recommender systems, um, actually a significant amount of work in recommender systems. Uh, we've done work in computer vision, energy and the environment, um, computational social science, uh, fairness, which I'm going to talk a little bit about, information integration, which I'll talk a little bit about, and malicious behavior detection. Um, all of these are up on our web page, and oftentimes the thing, I think they give like little templates for how to approach these problems. We're always looking for more, um, so if you're interested in trying to use PSL for something, we're happy to help and point you to the closest thing and so on. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised by the sophistication of the code. It really is, um, has become quite um, high quality code. Um, because this ties into my opening and my closing, I want to talk uh, about one of the applications, which is knowledge graph identification. Um, and construction. And I know there was a workshop on knowledge graphs and um, there's also papers on knowledge graphs. Let me just um, relate this to my original graph identification problem, uh, which in there we're doing the collective classification, the link prediction, and the entity resolution. In knowledge graph construction, you have these noisy extractions. You're doing all of those things, but then you also have some additional kind of ontological constraints that you can make use of. Potentially, you have some information about the confidence of your extractions. You know, PSL is a really nice framework for being able to kind of combine all this stuff together. And that's exactly what my uh, former PhD student, Jay Pujara, did in you know, quite a line of work. Um, let me highlight two sets of results. So one is around this knowledge graph um, construction and going across three different uh, knowledge graphs, able to look at um, kind of integrating the semantic information, integrating the extraction information, and more. And each of these buys you a little bit in terms of accuracy. And then the key thing is that we can do this fast. Um, another problem in knowledge graphs is this kind of knowledge completion. So you're trying to uh, complete an expression. There's been a lot of work which uses embedding methods. They're great if you have a lot of data and the data is clean, 
But in the setting where you have noisy data and sparse data, that's where something like PSL that can deal with that um, uh, is really powerful. And again, we've seen this in many different cases, even with the new PSL, where we're able to, um, in the low data settings, um, uh, perform quite well. So um, what I'd like to talk about now is kind of opportunities and challenges. And the, I'll start with the challenges. <laughs> and the challenges are kind of the perils of ignoring structure. And I'm gonna highlight three of them. So one I kind of hinted at before, which is privacy. So there's a fair bit of work in privacy that doesn't take into the account the graph structure. and um, there's a lot of information that can be leaked and leaked in kind of interesting ways. This is an early example of this by my former PhD student, Elena Zaliva, looking at how much information is leaked from group membership information. Uh, another area where structure is important is fairness. And so um, in fairness, the uh, taking into account the particularly the social structure, you know, that's very much what comes into uh, notions of uh, bias and so on is important. Uh, my former P uh, postdoc, Galnush and uh, Beirut, did some early work on kind of. Uh, representations of relational fairness, and I know there's a tutorial on fairness in graphs um, coming up, uh, so I think this is a really important area to take this into account. And then that fits in with causal reasoning and causal reasoning in structured domain. So there's causal graphs traditionally, but that once it really take into account the say, social structures or organizational structures. And I have collaboration um, that did some work on this. I know there was a workshop um, on uh, uh, causality. There's a lot of papers on causality at the um, conference. But fundamental is having some way to understand structure to mitigate the effects, whether fairness through causal, understanding the causal mechanisms to deal with fairness and privacy, I think are um, key. In terms of opportunities, um, you know, there's so many systems out there. There's biological systems, ecological systems, social systems. Sometimes we want to do all of them at once. You know, how do we deal with this? So one thing is we can use graph identification to construct graphs. We can do knowledge graph construction to construct knowledge graphs. But then we really want to kind of close the loop and you know, do all of these things uh, uh, to get more information out and potentially kind of keep going through this cycle. So I think really understanding how to do that properly is a key opportunity. And it kind of goes back to these areas. So in psychology, we had being able to reason about entities and their relationships, sociology, being able to talk about ties. Hopefully now you see from mathematics the idea of being able to have these abstract representations um, and reason about them. And then maybe even philosophy in terms of uh, being able to not reason kind of atomistically and do optimizations in these kind of complex social eco-bio systems um, in isolated ways, but take a bigger view. Um, I have to come to the most important part of my talk, which is acknowledgments. Uh, 
I, one of the best things about being a professor um, and being an academic is all the awesome students that uh, one gets to work with. So I'm very, very uh, proud and grateful um, to them. Uh, I've been fortunate to have a number of different sponsors, um, organizations, and companies that I've worked with. I really enjoy working with companies. Um, but in closing, um, I hope that I've provided you with these tools and templates for structure and uncertainty and that you can think about the problems that you work on and where you might be able to fit them in um, and think about opportunities for KDD methods that kind of combine probability and logic, neuro and symbolic and data driven and knowledge driven and you know, not surprisingly, uh, yeah, I think there's tons of cool applications and opportunities. So, thank you. Lisa, for the wonderful talk. And uh, we have 10, 10 minutes uh, for questions. Uh, people want to ask a question, please line up uh, in the two microphone in the, um, so you can start. And be aware that I totally can't see anything with the lights. So um, if you can help me uh, point out <laughs> and tell me where you're going. <laughs> Questions? Okay. So. Okay, yeah. Hi, Lisa, thank you for the wonderful talk. So I have the question about how can we get all those logical rules? So uh, how can we, say again? Uh, how can we get all those logical rules? Do experts give those rules or it can be learned automatically? All right, I planted you. <laughs> um, Let's see, can I still advance my slides? Oops. Oop. Uh, uh. Learning. So this is exactly the thing that I um, uh, had to kind of take, didn't get to talk about. Um, and folks that know me is know that kind of learning the structure of these models is near and dear to my heart. I've actually done a fair bit of work in this. Um, but I'm kind of coming to the notion. So first off, learning the structure of the rules um, is actually possible. So you can do search, intelligent search, over the space of models. We've done it. And oftentimes, it's not you know, uh, that challenging. On the other hand, many times, and that's kind of why I do the very tutorial part at the beginning, those little patterns are not that hard to encode. And um, they're intuitive, and they go across domains. So if the way that you kind of um, uh, get the rules is through searching over templates, then um, that actually can work quite well. And I personally think it's the right approach in a lot of these graphy settings so that it's a little bit of, you know, uh, talk to domain experts so that you do have some notion of um, what appropriate predicates might be. Then in, take that information, instantiate the templates, and then search over them. And that is actually some of the work that this um, UAI paper was particularly towards learning explainable models, where in that we didn't have the experts give the rules, but we did have the experts say, you know, which predicates were going to be more explainable than others. And combining that with um, um, a kind of intelligent search and some other smarts as well. So I think it ranges from, you know, you have an expert give you some rules, then you have automatic techniques for learning the parameters. So there's 
kind of a whole line of work on how you do the parameters. That's pretty straightforward. Um, another approach is that you do it fully data driven. And I really think the thing that's appropriate is the thing that's in the middle. Thank, Thank you. you. The next, uh, this gentleman, yeah. Hello, thanks for a great talk. And uh, I'm a PhD student. I'm Tan Yu Chen from PhD. I'm PhD a student from the Institute of Technology. And uh, I have a question about you mentioned your slides and that uh, uh, privacy and uh, fairness is very, are very important. Uh, I'm curious about could you have some comment on the relation of uh, privacy and, and fairness? And uh, isn't there a trade off? And uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah. So if I heard it correctly, it's uh, about privacy and fairness and yeah, um, relation, kind of maybe? relational, and, and then uh, is there a trade-off? Trade yeah. um, so the first answer about trade-off, uh, yes. Um, kind of not surprisingly, uh, but as an example from some of our own work, um, we actually found that the trade-off wasn't as extreme as one would think in the fairness setting. So we were looking in one of the relational fairness papers that we did at um, kind of a more complex notion of fairness where you took into account attributes of um, multiple individuals. Let me just kind of leave it at that. Uh, and in doing that, uh, we expected when we, we looked at different kinds of fairness constraints. Um, when we enforced the fairness constraints, we didn't pay um, uh, that high a price. So, um, you know, the unfortunate answer is it depends. So it depends on your domain and uh, so on, uh, uh, what the trade-off's gonna look like, and then uh, the trade-off around privacy and fairness is particularly interesting um, because, yeah, even to um, be able to evaluate fairness, there's, as people well know, um, then you may need some attribute information and that attribute information may um, be sensitive information and exactly how you kind of navigate that. I think there, there is some work out there that looks at it, but I think that, that that's very interesting and um, maybe, maybe that's the key trade-off that you were thinking of, uh, but nice, yeah. And I think to me, um, kind of hopefully the message in my talk is a lot about um, um, just being aware of the structure and um, really thinking that through is important. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The next question. So, mm. oh, here, right here. <laughs> Enjoyed your talk very much. Uh, uh, I'm wondering, uh, how do you think about structure? So in particular, uh, is every PSL specification corresponding to a structure? And vice versa, can every structure be encoded as a PSL program? Uh, yeah, so it's fair that I'm using the term structure in a um, kind of generic way through most of the talk. And then when I get to PSL, I have a little bit more interpretation that I'm gonna encode the structure using logical predicates. But notice, I'm trying to emphasize that in some cases you have observed the structure. So it's evidence that you can use in your model and so on. And in some cases, I'm trying to infer the structure. And when I infer the structure, as an example, infer a link, um, then I can make 
other decisions that are dependent upon that inference. So I think of um, the distinction between whether you have observed structure, whether you've inferred the structure, and then kind of closing the loop. But, yeah, but in PSL, it, it's represented as predicates. Um, so structure is a set of predicates. Uh, I'm to your uh, right. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, can you say it again? So in your mind, structure is some set of predicates. Um, so the structure that you decide to encode in your model is captured in the predicates. And the predicates can either be things that represent things that are observed or things that are inferred. But there is an ontological commitment that's made in your model by choosing the set of predicates that you represent. Of course, there's also the structure in your model, which is the structure of the rules. And that's almost, you know, this, uh, I can, the, my little, um, yeah. Trying to say this kind of meta graph identification is, um, all the different ways where you condition on structure, extract structure, you infer structure, you generalize the structure, and then you use that generalized structure to extract more um, is my kind of bigger view of it, irrespective of how, how we do it in PSL or how we do it in any other system. Got it. Thank you very much. You. Uh, we will hold on to the questions that Lisa will be around. The uh, during uh, the conference today, so uh, you know she can answer questions and discuss with people privately. So uh, and I hope that works, uh, Lisa. So so we only have a half hour uh, before we start the next uh, session. Uh, so uh, the, again, thank you. Thanks for the Lisa for the wonderful talk. And. The coffee break is in the exhibit hall down way the way the next the next floor. Yeah. Oh.